Hi, welcome to session one of the fifth topic of the semester titled Texas from Nationhood to Statehood, 1836 to 1860. So in this fifth topic, this is session one of the fifth topic, we're going to look at uh, the beginning stages of uh, the Texas Republic, Texas as we'll see, is going to uh, become a country in its own right, uh, a republic, an independent republic, and it will exist for about uh, 10 years. Again, this is the only uh, state of the Union in the United States that uh, was actually a nation, okay, that was actually a country, an independent country, uh, and all the other states were you know, colonies or territories that were uh, incorporated into the Union when the United States was born in 1787. We're going to see, of course, the beginning stages of the United States, the Union of States, uh, the integration of 13 uh, states into this Union. And from that point onwards, we're going to see the United States uh, moving west, growing westward territorially. There's going to be Americans, of course, moving westward, and in this process, uh, uh, territories will be organized, um, and once uh, those territories reaches reach uh, 60,000 inhabitants uh, in any given territory, uh, those territories couldn't just apply for uh, for statehood. They, they send a petition to Washington, D.C. Uh, to be incorporated as a state. So this was the process, again, by which uh, all of the states, after the original 13 colonies that became the United States, uh, this is how uh, all of the states, except Texas, actually were incorporated uh, into the Union of States. Uh, there were, again, first or, uh, territories that were settled by Americans, and when they reached 60,000 inhabitants, they applied for statehood. Uh, and Texas is the only exception because Texas, uh, before being incorporated into the Union, uh, after achieving independence from Mexico, uh, it was uh, actually a country. It created a republic, something we're going to see here, of course. And for 10 years, uh, Texas, you know, was an independent republic, has its own constitution, its own executive, its own president, and so on. Uh, system of elections and so on and so forth. And it was really trying to develop an economy as well during this period of time. So uh, it is in this session that we're going to pay attention to Texas as a nation. Uh, and also we're going to look at the process of annexation into the United States in the years between 1844-45. We're going to see a transition period by which Texas will be admitted uh, into the American Union uh, incorporated as a new state. And of course, that produced a conflict with Mexico for reasons that we're going to actually see here, uh, in, in this topic. And of course, there's going to be, of course, a conflict between the United States, uh, and Mexico that lasted until 1847 for about two years from 1845 to 1847. Uh, by 1848, the, the war was already over. Uh, once again, since, you know, uh, Mexico is going to lose vast uh, tracts of territory uh, in the northern fringes uh, from New Mexico all the way to California. So we're going to pay attention to that as well, uh, the war with Mexico, the process of annexation. And then we're going to look at, uh, in the last portion of this uh, topic, we're going to look at precisely at the period when Texas was actually a state uh, from 1845 to 1860, before the Civil War broke out in 1860, the period of so-called statehood. So let us look now at our uh, outline here. Uh, that way we can uh, begin our lecture. This is the title, Texas, From Nationhood to Statehood, 1836 to 1860. Uh, so again, this is a, the fifth topic of the semester we're starting and the table of contents I just, I just outlined uh, quite briefly uh, a few moments ago uh, is divided into three uh, parts. 
three segments. First, the Texas Republic from 1836 to 1845. We're going to look at that, of course, uh, the formation of the Texas Republic and that nine year, 10 year period or thereabouts again, in which you know, Texas was actually independent. Um, then we're going to, uh, look at the annexation process, the incorporation of Texas into the, the American Union and the U.S. Mexican War. As I just mentioned a moment ago, we're going to cover that as well in the second part. And then at last, um, in the third part, we're going to look at uh, the Texas state, uh, the periods between 1845 to 1860. This is, again, where now Texas was incorporated as, as a state in the Union. And again, we're going to stop roughly uh, around 1860. This is when... Uh, the Civil War, the U.S. Civil War is going to uh, to break out and we're going to make a stop there because um, the Civil War will be assessed in a separate topic. In the sixth topic, the, fo the following topic, we're going to actually cover Texas uh, during uh, the Civil War and Reconstruction, okay, in a separate discussion. All right, so let us then begin with uh, part one, okay, the... Texas um, Republic, okay? That's part one uh, from 1836 to 1845. And we're going to begin with the very formation of the nation itself, okay? Uh, it's called lounging a nation, trying to create a government. And this is, of course, occurring... Uh, in the midst of the Texas independence revolution around March, again, we're going to see the formation uh, of March of 1836. I mean, this is when Santa Ana is pretty much invading Texas, by the way. It's around that period of time when we're going to see the formation of a provisional government uh, that is going to have, of course, its own leaders that were uh, trying to coordinate uh, the war effort, particularly, so there, this is new government, again, is the government, the first government of Texas is provisional. So what we mean about provisional is that it's uh, temporary. Uh, this is a government that is formed in the midst of a struggle just to provide some form of coordination, some form of cohesion to the struggle to try to, of course, uh, coordinate the forces, try to raise revenues, etc. Uh, in win independence, you know, after winning independence, we're going to see now the formation, of course, of the formal political structures, the formal government. But this is a temporary provisional government. Uh, David Burnett was uh, selected to be the president of this provisional government initially. And also the vice president was, uh, 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 uh people that shows Lorenzo de Zavala, who had been engaged in this also process of uh, building a colony, colonizing Texas, in Northeast Texas precisely, he had actually uh, a, a land grant. He was an empresario as well. He was developing land, bringing colonists there in the area, etc. So he was very much active in this process of bringing colonists, and he's going to serve as vice president of this provisional government. A new constitution was introduced to formalize uh, this new political entity that is going to be called Texas. In other words, yes, it's going to be, there's going to be a provisional government, of course, but there's also going to be a series of laws. There's going to be a constitution that will be introduced. There'll be the law of the land, okay, the law of the land for Texas. You know, Texas has its own laws, its own constitution. And so, uh, the framers of this constitution, of course, uh, for the most part were, uh, were Americans who introduced a political culture that we have discussed in the past a great deal in the previous topic. Again, we were looking when we, we were assessing the Texas Revolution, for example. Uh, so they brought with them their, uh, Republican uh, ideas of government, okay, because uh, the United States was formed, it was founded as a republic in 1787. When the United States was born in 1787, finally, with the Constitution of 1787, it was created as a republic, 
had a republican system of government and really uh, the simple the simplest way to understand what a republican system of government is as i said here is a representative form of government again it's a government by which people elect their representatives you know there's of course a system of elections People vote and people elect their representatives and they rotate. In other words, look, they serve for a limited period of time, can be two years, can be four years or et cetera. And again, uh, based on their performance, they can either be reelected or they can be voted out, et cetera. Again, this is, that's what in essence a Republican uh, system of government is ruled by representatives. Uh, so people don't root rule directly okay their towns or the state you don't have to go and attend every council meeting uh, in your town in order to you know decide what kind of taxes you need to pay or whatever uh the city codes the city ordinances uh but rather we elect representatives to do that for us you know they're going to do that in our behalf that has again that's what a representative form of government is so americans are bringing with them, uh, their uh, political culture, their political philosophy that is rooted in this idea of republicanism, as classical republicanism, that, you know, the ideal state is one in which people choose their leaders, their representatives to r rule on their behalf, on people's behalf. Okay, so they're going to be there overseeing uh, the interest, the welfare of the general population, that is to say. And of course, there's a system of elections in which people, of course, are voting people in and out of office based on their merit, based on their performance, and etc. Okay, so it's extremely important, again, to understand that Texas, in many ways, was really a kind of... Uh, copy of the United States when it comes to uh, the Constitution. Okay, The Constitution of Texas was almost identical to the U.S. Constitution in, in many ways. Uh, I'm not suggesting that it was copied letter by letter as it was just, just you know, carbon copy, if you will, of the, of the U.S. Constitution, but it really preserved all the structure Okay, the basic institutions, the basic organization, the elements were there. Okay, maybe different wording, etc. You know, it, yes, it's true. But again, it's the essence, the structure, the organization is identical. Okay, uh, here in Texas, and Texas is arising as a republic as well. So that tells a lot that again, that the people that are creating uh, the Texas Republic are. Again, our Americans who are bringing with them, of course, uh, the ideas uh, that they inherited from their uh, forefathers, uh, you know, coming from this period of time, you know, from the I, from the times of the founding fathers, if you will, that had this vision uh, for the United States as a republic. In other words, you know, we need a representative form of government. In other words, and so of course that entailed that uh, those that are going to participate in the political process um, had to meet certain criteria. Those that uh, were allowed to vote, those that could, could hold political office had to meet the criteria of uh, owning property, qual property qualifications. Even if you own a, a small piece of land, didn't matter. So we're not talking here about, you know, only large landowners or plantation owners or wealthy merchants. Uh, I'm not really suggesting that, but you had to own land. Okay. You had to own land in order to participate in the political process. Because if, if you go back to the discussion of uh, the Texas revolution, when we were talking about, for example, uh, classical republicanism, this idea comes from ancient Greece from classical Athens, you know, the Greek city of Athens, of course, you know, from the writings of Plato, the philosopher Plato, uh, he's the one that actually wrote about the Republic. He's the one who coined the term, the Republic. Uh, and it, he was actually referring to this ideal form of government, the ideal state. And for Plato, the ideal state was 
you know, a republic and a republic was uh, a, a society that was governed uh, by the wisest, by philosophers, those that have the greatest virtue, uh, selfless, you know, interest. In other words, that they were not really ruling uh, the uh, community. They were not ruling the kingdom. They were not ruling the city, whatever the political community uh, is uh, on their own behalf for their own personal benefit, but rather for the general welfare. That is to say, very selflessly overseeing the welfare of all. And they were wise. They were educated. They were, you know, man, man of wisdom, man of virtue. Um, and so in, in more contemporary terms, uh, the founding fathers, both of the United States and the Texas Republic, interpreted uh, that idea of uh, a republic is one in which people are ruled by philosophers, by the wise and so on, as simply as people that are the most educated, in other words. So if you want to have a republic, you have to be led, you have to be governed by the most educated, okay, uh, individuals, the most educated sector of society. Again, those are the ones that are going to be making the choices because they have the mental, intellectual preparation, development to understand the world, to reason, to come up with solutions, to analyze the world around them, to uh, conduct investigations or research, etc., into different fields of human activity, whether it's economics or law or politics, commerce, you name it. And they could actually find out what will be the best solution for the problems that arise, again, in human societies, again, or in the world of nature for that matter. They were men of science, they will say, you know, the, the man of reason, they call them. Uh, so who were the men of science? Who were the men of reason? Uh, for uh, the founding fathers of both Texas and the United States were, were people that own land. Property owners, for the most part, have a vested interest in society. And if you own land, that means, according to their interpretation, that more than likely you have received some form of education because you own land, in other words. You own property, uh, you perhaps own an enterprise, so you have a vested interest in society. You have something at stake in, a, in society. You're doing some, something productive for society, so therefore, uh, because you have a vested interest and because you have the means, you have the resources to get an education, you were considered to be one of the most educated sectors of society. Uh, that can be debated, of course, you know, I'm not suggesting that that was, you know, an absolute truth that applied to everybody that owned land, but that was the criteria that people uh, interpreted, you know, how people interpreted, of course, a republic back during those times that we have to be ruled by the wisest with the most educated. In other words, so property qualifications for voting and holding office was, again, part of uh, this Republican ideal, this classical Republicanism that Texas is incorporating in the Constitution. Okay. Um, of course, uh, there's going to be a very similar uh, structure. The government of Texas, the Republic is going to, to be divided into three branches. This was known as the checks and balances mechanism. Of course, you're going to have, of course, an executive branch, a president. You're going to have a legislative branch, okay, a Congress uh, based, uh, you know, that this is going to be the political body made up of the representatives coming from the different settlements, the different towns, the different cities of Texas, and they're going to be representing the will of the people writing legislation as well. That's what's called the legislative branch. They write laws. Uh, and there's going to be also a judicial branch, okay, a, a system of courts, as well, and they supposed to, of course, work in a way that they balance each other. So no power is all concentrated into a single branch, just like the U.S. Constitution. Okay, so the executive branch, however, in in Texas, uh, was formed to serve for only three years. Okay, it's only a three-year limit. And they couldn't be reelected. 
uh, not immediately back to back. They could be reelected in a future day, okay, after another president served, after, you know, the president that was coming out, again, somebody's going to be elected for three years, and that person had to wait for another three years to be running for re-election, in other words, okay? So that's how, again, this is the some of the minor differences, if you will, uh, between the U.S. and the Texas Constitution. Uh, in the United States, it's four years uh, with the possibility of re-election, but here there is no immediate back-to-back -back consecutive re-election. It's only three years of service, okay? You also are going to see in the Texas Revolution, of course, a Bill of Rights. You know, this is what uh, the Constitution states uh, that uh, the liberties, the guarantees, the rights of citizens, and of course, is uh, seen here uh, that among those the sacred rights that people enjoy, besides what is called life and liberty, is also property. And it is here that we witness that very early on, uh, slaves were considered to be also a form of property. So there was also, you know, the right to hold slaves because in the Texas Constitution, it was stated that uh, people had the right to their property and slaves were considered a form of property. So thereby it legalized uh, slavery. Okay, the Texas Republic, you know, very early on, this is a, a, a slave-holding uh, republic, if you will, you know, ever since the start. And, of course, this is something we have seen uh, early on. Uh, when we were looking at um, the Texas Revolution, we were looking at uh, the introduction of cotton plantation, the development of cotton agriculture, uh, and, of course, the introduction of slavery. Of course, in the late 1820s, early 1830s, we're going to see, of course, the presence, the growing presence of African slaves in those cotton plantations. And so this was only a, the continuation of a system that was already present in Texas, but it's going to increase, as we'll see uh, in this topic. Okay. And of course, it's going to be a separation of church and state. And again, the, the, the reason why we see this in, in the Texas Constitution is because uh, the experience that uh, the settlers, the colonists in Texas, the Tejanos and, and, and all of the groups of Texas had with Mexico, uh, meaning that uh, Mexico had a central church, the Catholic church that was trying to uh, monopolize uh, religion in Mexico and enforce, impose the Catholic faith on all the peoples of Mexico um, and being so involved in matters of state, of course, and this is one of the leading causes for the Texas Revolution. If you go back, of course, to that topic, uh, Santa Ana pretty much changed the constitution of Mexico um, in, in 1835 because he came to terms with the large landowners and the Catholic Church to grant uh, undue powers, again, to the landowners, to the army and the church. And the church was pretty much behind Santana, trying to use Santana in a way uh, to exert a religious monopoly on Mexico. And of course, that's one of the reasons why Texas is going to declare independence, because there's a large Protestant, of course, population that did not want, of course, the new Texas Republic now, now that it's independent, uh, to also create a state church or an official religion that, you know, everybody must follow. So rather, they just pretty much separated church and state and left people to pursue their own religious and spiritual needs uh, in private. Okay? So that's another thing. Again, that's just, this, of course, this is something that has been uh, developing for centuries, the separation of church and state is one of the struggles, again, of the age of revolutions. But the peoples of Texas had a direct experience, again, with Mexico, with the Catholic Church of Mexico in this regard. So they just want to make sure that the Texas Republic is not going to repeat that particular experience. Okay, so what is, or 
the duties of the new Texas Republic. Okay, what are the duties of the new Texas Republic? So as I mentioned a moment ago, when this provisional government was formed, uh, and we see, of course, the, the election of a president, vice president, again, uh, there was a purpose, again, for creating the very first uh, structures of an independent Texas government. Um, and the purpose is, like I said, to coordinate the war efforts. It was necessary because otherwise, well, what you were going to see when Santa Ana was, you know, coming into Texas was simply outburst of uh, violence in different settlements, different towns, you know, very fragmented with no coordination, a uh, series of uprisings here and there uh, with no common purpose. So it was necessary to form this republic, uh, this government, in order to provide coordination, to bring all those efforts together under a single leadership, even though it was quite difficult to do so uh, immediately. I mean, there was no really willingness by everybody to simply just, you know, uh, follow a single leader per se. Uh, but that was the intent to try to kind of bring all of the different factions, all of the different forces that were fighting against Santana to bring them together. And that was the idea. Um, and of course, it was trying to raise revenues, try to finance the war effort, the independence war against Santana, etc. you know, trying to come up with monies and so on. Uh, because it was necessary, again, to to continue. No, nobody knew exactly when Santana was going to to leave Texas, if he was going to be defeated at all. Uh, so it was uncertain. So again, this is one of the reasons why this Texas government had to be created. Also, this new Texas Republic uh, was uh, very much involved after, after Santana was defeated in San Jacinto, in the Battle of San Jacinto. Uh, it was also very much involved in trying to ensure the ratification of the Treaty of Velasco. This is the treaty that Santa Ana signed uh, that agreed with the independence of Texas. Santa Ana is the, the the leader of Mexico, whether he was called a president or a dictator, etc. But he was the official legitimate uh, ruler of Mexico that by signing that document, the treaty, it, uh, it validated the document. I mean, the leader of Mexico is actually agreeing with the independence of Texas. He was captured after the battle. And uh, even though many of the forces under Sam Houston wanted Santa Ana to be, to be, uh, to be executed uh, for all the crimes Santa Ana commit, committed in El Alamo, the massacre of El Alamo and Goliad, uh, Sam Houston decided to spare Santa Ana's lives you know, because he was more useful alive than dead. Because look, uh, he is the legitimate ruler of Mexico and he's signing this document. Uh, and if we keep him alive, we actually send him back. Uh, you know, that's a guarantee that the person that actually signed the independence of Texas uh, is alive and he's still the ruler of Mexico. So if we just, you know, execute him, Mexico is going to select another leader and this whole process is going to repeat. They're going to send another force. We're going to continue fighting for our independence in many years to come. So it was a strategic decision by Sam Houston to leave him alive. And of course, the duty of this new Texas Republic was to ensure that Santana will honor the treaty. He was sent back. He was allowed to return with just a handful of soldiers. Um, and upon his return, of course, Santana will be heavily criticized in Mexico City by his peers. Um, there were politicians that despised him in Mexico City. There was a lot of intrigues and so on. Uh, you got a lot of critics, journalists and so on. He heavy criticism because he lost. I mean, he, he was uh, defeated okay, in, in Texas and he lost an entire army, 6,000 soldiers. So it was very humiliating again for, for Santana. Uh, and of course, he's not going to 
honor the treaty once he arrives to Mexico City. He's going to disregard the Treaty of Velasco, saying that, well, you know, uh, this treaty is not valid because I was forced to sign it and under uh, international law, uh, whatever uh, resemblance of international law existed back in this day, uh, it was agreed that treaties that were signed under coercion, under force, by pressure, that those were not valid. So he was using legal arguments to say, oh, this is not valid. So uh, he did not recognize Texas independence. He considered Texas to be part of Mexico, and he considered Texas to be only in, in a state of rebellion. In other words, this is a rebellious state. And by the way, this was not uncommon again, in Mexico, to say, due to the fact that there were other regions of Mexico that are also declared independence. Uh, for example, let me just write it here so you can have, of course, a, the name of this. Uh, the Republic of Yucatan, there was, again, in Southeast Mexico, uh, there is a, and the, it was called the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, when Santana seized power in 1836, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula also declared independence from Mexico uh, in a similar fashion that Texas did, by the way, okay, and the Texas during the Texas Revolution. Uh, so uh, the peoples of Yucatan came together and actually formed their own republic called the Republic of Yucatan, by the way. And they declare themselves to be independent, separate, completely from Mexico, a sovereign nation. Uh, they will later be reintegrated, by the way, into Mexico. This was not really a permanent uh, uh, status. Again, that Yucatan will simply go in its, in its own way. Uh, it will be reintegrated years later, by the way. But uh, it was also considered a region in a state of rebellion, in a state of revolt, revolt by the way, okay, by by the capital city in Mexico by Santa Ana and and the central and the central government uh, of this new Mexico that was created by Santa Ana, the centralized republic. So yes, was outbursts of resistance, outbursts of violence in different regions of Mexico. So it was not uncommon for Santa Ana to say, "Oh, uh, Texas is just in a state of revolt, just like Yucatan." In other words, you know, the, they think they have a republic, you know, on their, of their own, but will later reintegrate them into the country. That was the idea. Uh, we're gonna get to that point as to what happened, you know, when they tried to reintegrate uh, Texas, of course, and there's gonna be a struggle, as we'll see again with the U.S. Uh, okay, so another duty of the Texas. Uh, Republic was to call for elections, you know, once the independence was gained and once Santana was uh, driven out of Texas, uh, they were to call for elections in order for people to choose the president, okay, because uh, there was only a provisional president that was chosen. But now we're going to see a general election by which the peoples of Texas will cast their vote and choose their their president, their formal president. This is the first president of the Texas Republic, Sam Houston, who was the commander in chief of the uh, rebel forces, again, that defeated Santa Ana. Okay? And he was chosen as to be the new president, and he's going to uh, serve for three years from 1836 to 39. Again, it's a three-year term. Um, he had plenty of political experience uh, prior to arriving uh, to Texas. Uh, he had been a U.S. congressman uh, from 1830, uh, 1823 to 27, and he was also the governor of uh, Tennessee uh, from 1827 to 29. So he had plenty of administrative uh, experience. He was a very skilled uh, politician, I should say. Um, he was very practical, you know, politician. He 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 had a practical side, very pragmatic. So uh, he was uh, willing to negotiate with different factions and forces, you know. 
So he had his own style, but he was very practical in his style of governance uh, in this case. Um, and uh, people elected him by far. He was the hero of the Texas independence war. Uh, he's the one that defeated Santana. So that's no ordinary feat again. So he was like the George Washington of Texas, you know, consider again, something like that. Uh, George Washington was the commander in chief of the Continental Army that fought the British during the American Revolution. So it's comparable. Again, it's just the comparison, if you will. Okay. Um, and the vice president was uh, chosen to be uh, Lamar. Okay. Uh, Mirabeau Lamar, and they were the VP, the vice president that is also going to serve under Sam Houston. And we're going to see that, of course, they're going to develop certain differences uh, which over time, uh, they are going to be translated into policy when Lamar will become the next president after Houston, as we'll see. Uh, and he also came in tex into Texas with plenty of expertise. He had been, of course, a Georgia congressman. Uh, and that, of course, you know, gave him also a certain, uh, skills to, to come into Texas and serve as vice president. But as we'll see, they do uh, have different political views, different political philosophies, different ways of governing that are going to be very visible in the way they're trying to build the nation because that's exactly what they were doing at this time. Texas is just, again, a newly, a, a newborn nation that has to be shaped you have to create the institution, the political institutions, the economic institutions, and give it life. How do you see this uh, new nation moving forward? You know, so it has to be created. It's not there. You have to shape it. You have to create it. And we're going to see, of course, different ways, different styles of moving Texas forward by both Houston and Lamar. Um, so also some of the duties of the new Texas Republic, okay, uh, was also to solicit loans, okay, from the United States and also uh, European powers uh, in order to finance, of course, the new nation, to develop the nation for investment, for example, if you want to build roads, uh, transportation systems, etc. Uh, develop the land and the like. I mean, you need, you need money. Okay. Uh, you need to pay for administrators and so on and so forth. Again, so you need to solicit loans. So that's why it was important to create a government, a formal government that will deal again with those issues, solicit loans, issue promissory notes, what is called just money. Okay. Uh, the promissory note is the currency, if you will, to start printing the money to negotiate treaties, commercial treaties with the United States and other nations as well, uh, to develop a Navy and an army as well. Okay. That was again, some of the very administrative functions, uh, that the Republic was commissioned to do. Uh, you, this is, this is basic. Again, you got to create a nation. You need a nation that can perform certain key functions. Okay. Like issuing money and so on, negotiate treaties and the like. And, uh, also to secure diplomatic recognition. In other words, what you need to do is also create a government that is valid, that is legitimate, uh, that people have elected. Okay. Through the process of elections and voting, etc., uh, for the purpose of gaining recognition from other countries. This is important. Because if you don't gain that recognition, uh, therefore, uh, it will very def be very difficult for nations to extend any benefits to you, like loans or credit or people investing in your country, etc. cetera. Uh, because as I mentioned a moment ago, Mexico does not recognize the independence of Texas. Okay. It just doesn't. So, uh, from the perspective of Mexico, Texas is just a state in Mexico, of Mexico, in a state of rebellion. Okay? So Mexico does not recognize the independence of Texas. 
You see, so simply Texas is another state, but the peoples of Texas say, no, we are independent, okay? And we have the right to form our own government. And of course, we have to the, the right to uh, govern our own affairs and develop our own country economically. We're separate, we're sovereign, okay? We're totally separate from Mexico. We make our own decisions here. We have our own constitution. We elect our own leaders and so on. So, so it's important that this government gain the recognition, okay, from other countries that other countries will say, yes, indeed, Texas is indeed an independent state and we can deal with them. We can make right treaties. We can invest in Texas. We can buy land, etc. Okay. We can help that country develop. Okay. It's a country, in other words. So you, this government was also very much involved in trying to secure diplomatic recognition from the U.S., from European countries to validate Texas independence, to obtain loans from the United States and Europe. And also, last but not least, to request also uh, annexation into the American Union. Uh, so they were trying to also be recognized as independent because by doing so, then it will facilitate the transfer of Texas into the American Union because this is not a Mexican state, you know, that is just simply being absorbed into the United States. Uh, if other countries recognize the independence of Texas, then this is just an independent country that is willing to be annexed you know, into another country as another state, that is to say. So it just uh, made the process easier, more valid, more legitimate, in other words, uh, when you're formally recognized as an independent state, okay? Uh, and so very early on, since 1836, of course, there, there are uh, letters, there's petitions sent to Washington, D.C. from Texas uh, petitioning uh, members of Congress in Washington, D.C., uh, to admit Texas as a new state in, in the Union, okay? Uh, so since very early on, ever since Texas won independence, we see that the peoples of Texas desire to become part of the, of the Union, okay? There was a desire, there were petitions, there were letters sent, uh, and not until March the 1st of 1837, we're going to see the U.S. Senate finally recognizing the Republic of Texas. So it was a little bit delayed, again, the recognition, even though they're already receiving petitions by the population in Texas, because overwhelmingly the vast majority of the peoples of Texas uh, are Americans. Of course, so there is a uh, emotional connection uh, to the United States, there's, you know, uh, a desire by the population to simply be integrated into this country. They actually came from the United States, okay? Uh, so we see that very early on, okay, since 1836, 37, in almost every year, ever since 1836, 37, 38, 39, every year, Texas is, Texas Republic, this independent country is sending petitions uh, to Washington, D.C., uh, the United States, to be uh, annexed, to be incorporated into the Union, okay? Uh, and the question is, you know, why didn't the United States just simply annex Texas? It was just, you know, kind of like the general, uh, you know, uh, popular demand. This is the general population demanding annexation. It's overwhelming. Um so there was a delay, again, in this annexation process by the United States. The U.S. delays Texas annexation for several reasons. There were several reasons why the United States delayed the annexation. And one is, of course, the issue with Mexico. Mexico did not recognize the Republic of Texas. So that was one issue that even though there was the overwhelming demand by the general population of Texas to be part of the United States that integrating Texas rather quickly will simply ignite some form of diplomatic problem with Mexico. Okay, maybe a conflict, maybe diplomatic 
relationship will be damaged. Uh, so that was one issue, not the only issue, but it was one of the many issues why annexation was delayed. Okay. And trying to avoid problems with Mexico. Okay. Number two is that from 1836 to 39, uh, the United States was going through an economic depression. Okay. An economic depression hit the United States from 1836 to 39. And what that did was that it really created a crisis in the United States by which people saw that the most important problems of the country was not really Texas, that the country needed to recover from the depression, that what policymakers in Washington, D.C., senators and representatives need, needed to be doing, simply trying to solve the problems of the economy, that is to say, okay, as opposed to be, you know, concerned about, you know, uh, annexing territories or annexing Texas, which, by the way, people interpreted the annexation of Texas to be leading to an inevitable, inevitable conflict with Mexico, and this was not desirable when the country was experiencing economic crises like this economic depression. Okay, we're in the midst of the depression. We're in the midst of this depression. We're going to, you know, uh, annex Texas and we're going to get into a conflict with Mexico. <laughs> that's not wise, in other words. This is what how Americans are thinking at this time. So that's why it was also delayed, you know, this process of annexation as well. Okay, uh, the economic problems, again, of the United States. Uh, again, made people pretty much just, you know, uh, look the other way and say, okay, look, we need to postpone this. Uh, and of course, the third problem as well that delayed Texas annexation was uh, the fact that Americans were becoming increasingly divided starting in the 1830s over the issue of slavery. The fact is that... Uh, Americans were moving west, okay, during this time. And they have been moving west, you know, since 1803, by the way. 1803 is a key year in U.S. history because this is the year when the United States purchased the Louisiana Territory from France, okay? So it's a large tract of land, uh, all the central plains of the United States, what is the United States today, the central plains, uh, all the way, the midsection of the United States, just see that the central plains, all the way to uh, the region of what today is the present day Louisiana into the Gulf of Mexico, the port of New Orleans. This is a gigantic landmass uh, for $50 million. Uh, France actually sold it to the United States. So ever since 1803, Americans have been moving west at a great pace to settle the new the new acquired lands in the Louisiana Territory, uh, and many of them are also coming to to Texas as well. We mentioned, you know, already that you know colonization in you know by Americans in in Texas uh, in the 1820s and 30s, uh, and so uh, this is a trend, of course, in U.S. history. The early decades of the 1800s, we see vast numbers of Americans moving westward. Uh, at a great speed, and the country was growing territorially as well. But what divided Americans is, again, uh, the issue of slavery in terms of, well, are we going to take our slaves with us uh, as we move westward, or are we going to close the doors to slavery and only move people that are looking for land for farming, and they are looking for jobs, they want to be hired, they want to be paid wages for their work. So uh, do we create, again, territories and states in the West that are going to be free? Or should we just open the doors, again, to the slave owners to move their slaves into the West so they can create plantations and, of course, use their slaves for the work? that is needed to grow cotton, whatever they're going to do. So this has, again, divided Americans between what's called the free soil, uh, you know, advocates, most of whom were 
located uh, in the north part of the country, in the northern states called the free soil. They want the West to be free soil or uh, the pro-slavery advocates, most of whom are in the South, in the slaveholding states of the South, that want uh, the, this, uh, the territories of the West uh, to, to, to welcome slavery. Okay, uh, and again, those divisions reach all the way to to the Senate and the House of Representatives in Washington D.C. So even Congress was divided because there were representatives from the North, there were representatives from the South that both argued that it was important to uh, either limit the welcoming of new slave states or simply uh, welcome, okay, the admission of slave states, okay? So Northern congressmen wanted to limit annexing territories into the Union as new slave states, uh, whereas in the South, it was the actually opposite. So even congressmen were fighting back and forth. And of course, when Texas applied for, for statehood, when they sent petitions to Washington, D.C., uh, Texas is applying as a slave state, okay? Because as I mentioned, slavery is, is now legal in Texas, uh, it's in the constitution, it's considered property, it's one of the rights to property. Uh, so therefore they're applying as a slave state. And of course, this also delayed the process of annexation because Northern congressmen opposed the annexation of Texas uh, due to the fact that it was applying as a slave state. They wanted Texas to come in as a free state, a free soil. Okay, uh, so again, this also kind of delayed uh, the annexation because this really divided people in Congress. There was a lot of debate, a lot of arguments back and forth. And because the North had uh, a relative majority in terms of numbers, they always made sure to block, you know, uh, any attempts by the Southern representatives in Congress to pass the bill for uh, the Texas annexation as a slave state. So again, it was slavery, the issue of slavery that actually delayed the annexation as well, okay? Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, by this time, there's already in Congress a growing group of representatives, uh, senators and, and also representatives from the House of Representatives uh, uh, that are abolitionists. Okay, what they call Northern abolitionists. They're representing the Northern states, most of which are already abolishing slavery in their own state constitution. So most of the upper states, the Northern states are already in their own state constitutions abolishing slavery. Okay, and there's a growing abolitionist movement uh, in the United States and uh, that demands uh, a reform. They demand an amendment in the US constitution to abolish slavery. They want to see the end of slavery in the constitution and everywhere, uh, uh, that is. And many of those abolitionists uh, are already in Congress, okay? They're representing their own Northern states. And now uh, the Northern abolitionists in Congress are already uh, uh, pronouncing the idea and sometimes even publicly, by the way, and those are ideas of the abolitionists, by the way. This is not just what congressmen are, uh, congressmen are thinking, but the abolitionist movement as a whole is now looking at the South, <clears throat> at the slaveholding South, particularly the planter class, the slave owners, as to be uh, a force of their own, uh, what they call a power slave, that is to say, that they're... Uh, wealth that they have built for many decades uh, under a cotton economy, growing cotton, exporting cotton again to the world and using slave labor, that they have become incredibly wealthy, that they're using their wealth to expand slavery into Texas and also across all the Western territories and that they will eventually use their wealth to lobby congressmen. You know, in other words, make economic contributions, you know, to people in Congress to convince them to vote in favor, again, of Texas annexation, to bring Texas into the union 
as a slave state as well. So there's already, again, a fight. There's already drama, again, in Congress, in which the Northern representatives are abolitionists that are already denouncing, again, uh, the South uh, as planning, if you will, to expand slavery everywhere, you know, across the nation, not only in Texas, but also in the Western territories and everywhere, in other words, again. Uh, so again, Congress is very much divided under the issue, so that's why this delayed the annexation of Texas, okay? You know, there's a lot of argument, of course, back and forth uh, over this issue. And the bill uh, proposed by the Southern states to annex Texas always caused uh, problems, always caused arguments, okay? So it was rather, they pretty much left it in, in, in the back burn, if you will, you know, the issue of Texas annexation for a future day. Uh, so, again, this is something that we're going to see in, in great detail when we look at annexation, okay? The issue of annexation uh, that we're going to be looking at precisely in this particular uh, topic in the second segment. But as for now, let's proceed with uh, the financial and political administration of the Republic of Texas, okay, the financial and political administration of the Republic of Texas, okay. Remember, this is a state, this is a country, I'm sorry, this is a republic, this is a country that is trying to shape the nation, it's trying to create the institutions, it's trying to organize it. And this require, of course, making sure that there will be proper finances, in other words, to finance the nation. You need to raise revenues, as we'll see, in order to conduct all the economic activities, all the administrative functions, etc. So we're going to see in that nine to 10 year period when Texas was an independent republic, how Texas uh, was attempting to uh, coordinate the finances and also shape the political administration again. So let's look at how Sam Houston, the first president of Texas, is attempting to manage the finances of Texas. So Sam Houston had um, had a vision uh, that he implemented it into into action, a series of policies that he believed were going to get the country going economically, okay, to manage the finances, of course. So first and foremost, it was necessary to raise revenues, okay. Uh, in order to pay for administrative functions, like, for example, you need to pay the elected officials. You have elected officials. People are chosen to lead the towns, the mayors, for example, and so on, all the way to the president. And they need to get paid. Uh, and how are you going to, again, uh, pay for all those administrators, all those elected officials, well, you need to raise revenues, of course. You need to pay for those foreign diplomats. You're sending diplomats, you're sending them to Europe, you're sending them to the United States to deal with treaties, etc. Uh, so you also need to pay them. Of course, and you also have a military. Again, you also need to pay the members of the military as well. Uh, you also need to raise revenues, Houston said, in order to pay for the debt Texas now holds a debt of $1.25 million that goes back to the monies that Texas received for the independence struggle, okay? It has a debt of its own that needs to rep repay. So it is therefore necessary to raise revenues. How Sam Houston uh, attempted to raise revenues, he implemented a series of policies precisely geared to raise those revenues to pay for all those expenses, you know, to, to, to run the country, in other words. So first, you introduce new taxes, okay? So he taxed products that were imported into Texas, okay? From the Eastern coast, we're gonna see the arrival of products, 
products that were consumed in the interior of the country, those have to be taxed at the port of entry, okay? Also, people need to pay property taxes as well in order to also raise revenues. And also people that own livestock, animals, etc., you know, cattle, uh, mules, horses, etc., needed to also pay for uh, taxes on those, you know, animals I, as well. Again, so this was an attempt by Houston to start really building the finances, printing money. Again, he began to pretty much print Texas dollars. Okay. Uh, so uh, there were critics, of course, during this time that believed that he was just printing too much, you know, money that in, 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 in the end was causing the devaluation of the Texas dollar. Because when you have an excess, a surplus of money circulating in the economy, and uh, it renders, it renders that money worthless eventually. Okay. So, uh, actually, one, uh, you know, U.S. dollar uh, was the equivalent uh, for about 14 cents, okay, of uh, Texas dollar. In other words, the Texas dollar was worthless, that uh, it was only worth 14 cents uh, of the U.S. dollar itself. It was just, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you know, the Mexican peso, for example, uh, is so devalued that uh, the U.S. dollar is so much stronger, again, than the Mexican peso, that in order to buy one uh, U.S. dollar, you need to gather, you know, like 21 pesos or something like that uh, just to buy one, one U.S. dollar. Again, it's just so devalued, in other words. Uh, so similarly, uh, what we see is that uh, it, the Texas dollar, of course, was you know, in the, in the face of the American dollar also was worth very little. So, uh, so again, so this is the issue of printing excess money. Okay. Uh, you also see the, uh, another policy of Sam Houston was to try to avoid Indian conflicts. So he believed Indian conflicts were rather expensive. In other words, look, every time we engage in, in conflict with the Native Americans, um, if we institute a policy of ongoing conflict, that this is going to drain the finances, getting more in the Texas more in debt. So we need to change our course, change our policy, because this is going to um, disrupt our finances and lead us to bankruptcy. So we need to pretty much uh, avoid those conflicts. Okay. So he was, you know, advocating for a policy of reconciliation or perhaps trying to build more you know diplomatic relationship with Native American groups and also and trying to encourage uh, immigration for land development okay so to encourage immigration for land development meant that he was trying to bring in investors that will come into Texas and develop the land, okay? Uh, some of those investors are going to immigrate, they're going to settle, they're going to be immigrant groups arriving, for example, from different parts of the world, particularly from the United States. He also wants to bring immigrants from Europe. Uh, but his idea is that if we welcome more immigration, that they're going to bring, of course, labor on one hand, but also some capital, and they're going to build an enterprise that will generate wealth, wealth for the state, wealth you can tax, etc. Again, or wealth in terms of you know products that will be exported into other regions, and you know there's another source of revenue when you export products. You know there's going to be a flow of capital coming in into the country. Uh, so again. He's really very much involved in this process of trying to encourage immigration for land development. He's trying to actually award land to the war veterans, many of the volunteers that came from the United States, volunteers that came from Louisiana, came from Kansas, for example. And they were to return back to the United States after independence, but he, what he wants to do is make them stay. So he's pretty much incentivizing their stay by awarding the war veterans with land 
so they can stay in Texas and develop the land, of course. Uh, he institutes a new land policy of trying to extend land grants to individuals that are willing to uh, build an enterprise. So they're being given, you know, a few years uh, to develop the land uh, uh, in order to for them to actually receive the in valid authorized entitlement of ownership of the land. So they're being given a piece of land and there's going to be a waiting period by which if they really want to own it, if they want the property title to be given to them, they're going to have to prove that they're they're actually involved in developing the land. They're building a farm, they're building a plantation, uh, whatever enterprise it is. And if they are indeed building that enterprise, they're going to be given, you know, the title, the full title, the authorized legal title of their land. Okay. So that's an exchange there. The land is there, but you need to develop it uh, to own it. And of course, in this new land policy, he's going to actually you know, uh, award significant tracts of land to families, families that wanted to start an enterprise there will be given 640 acres again uh, to develop some form of enterprise. So remember, this is more for commercial purposes. This is not just a piece of land so people can live, but rather again, land development, uh, like a commercial farm, for example, uh, cattle ranch, plantations and the like. Okay, uh, and single individuals were actually given 320 acres, you know, single individuals with no families, uh, they were given 320 acres if they were willing to develop an enterprise again, so they will be given the land. So again, he's coming up with all sorts of strategies in order to get the republic going. And of course, he's also going to turn to selling public lands as well, trying to put land on the market for people to buy it, to attract investors from the United States, particularly to come into Texas and buy public lands. And with that, of course, he's going to raise those revenues. And those are actually revenues or taxes that will be collected by the selling of public lands as well. Okay. So, Again, there's going to be, of course, a new political administration as well. It's not just a financial structure of beginning to raise taxes. And this leads to, of course, taxes on imports and property. And we're going to see also, you know, colonization, immigration, of course, land development, something that has been going on, by the way, during the Mexican period is being continued by Sam Houston but also the political administration as well, okay, is going to be shaped in that uh, Texas established its own boundaries, okay, the political boundaries, that is to say. So what is the political boundary? What is the territory that is within the Texas Republic? This is a country, remember. So this country needed to establish its own boundaries, okay? Boundaries that will separate Texas from Mexico, but also from the other territories uh, surrounding Texas to the north and the west as well. Okay, so this is how Texas looked like according to this period of time that we're talking about, the Republic of Texas in that nine, ten year period. This was the territory that uh, Texas claimed as to be part of this republic. Originally, as you can see, Texas according to Mexico, okay? And Mexico itself has its own maps as to what Texas was, was the Texas province, the Texas state, um, that really go back to uh, the Spanish period, okay? When the Spanish empire colonized all this land and developed the provinces, uh, it actually signed a treaty, we're gonna get there eventually, uh, with the United States, uh, when the United States bought Louisiana from France in 1803, we're going to see disputes between the United States and uh, Spain as to what was really the boundary between Louisiana and Texas. And when the treaty was signed in 1919, again, we're going to get there. Right now, I'm just giving you kind of an introduction to that. Uh, in the Spanish and American treaty, 
it was decided again that this was the size of Texas, you know, the, here the place in yellow. That was considered Texas for Spain, that is to say. So when Mexico gained independence from Spain, finally in 1821, Mexico continued with the idea that this was the Texas province, so this Texas state, <laughs> okay? Uh, but when Santana signed the Treaty of Velasco after he was defeated by Sam Houston, Santana in that treaty agreed that the new boundary of Texas with Mexico was going to be the Rio Grande River, the Rio Grande, okay? The, the river that actually divides uh, Texas and Mexico today, okay? So Sam Houston indicated to Santana, you're gonna sign this treaty, you're gonna say that this Texas is independent, you agree, and that the political boundary that divides Texas and Mexico is the Rio Grande, again, further to the south, of what Spain and Mexico had thought of uh, Texas to be. And so that included, of course, territories that extended all the way into what today is present day New Mexico and areas of Colorado as well. Again, all of that uh, were now constituting the Republic of Texas. This is territory that uh, Texas claimed which by the way, all of this territory is also claimed by Mexico. So it's not just that Mexico doesn't recognize the independence of Texas, but also territories that Texas considered to be part of the Republic. All of the territories that you see here in green, those are also territories that Mexico contests. They also say that those territories are part of the New Mexico uh, state or the New Mexico province, uh, not from Texas. So we're going to see that this is going to lead to disputes again between uh, Texas and Mexico. And when Texas becomes part of the United States in 1844-45, uh, there was the, all this land was disputed now between the U.S. and Mexico. Again, this land you see here in green. Uh, and this is going to lead to the Amer uh, Mexican-American War. Okay, of 1845. We're going to cover that, of course, uh, much later. But again, this is a new administration. Again, this is the political boundaries that Texas is establishing, you know, in 1836. This is, again, the country of Texas. Okay. Uh, most of the uh, peoples of Texas actually live here in this area of yellow, the vast majority, not all of them, but the vast majority. Okay. Uh, Texas also replaced the political system that Mexico had established and replace it with a system that was more akin to the system of the United States. Because again, Americans are going to bring with them, of course, their own political, uh, you know, uh, structures that are going to replace the political structures, uh, structures uh, of Mexico that were actually still in place. So the municipio, the municipal governments that was not just confined to the city or a town, but also integrated a series of land surrounding that town or city. So a municipio was a large, again, territorial domain that was uh, governed, if you will, by a main town in the main town had it's of course a government that pretty much was in charge not only of the people living in the town but all of the lands the adjacent lands again surrounding the city that was what a municipio uh, that was replaced by what today is simply known as a county okay so texas is known to consist of a multiplicity of different counties um, so those were previously known as municipios and they're going to be replaced by the counties and the alcalde, which was the local official, the, the, uh, the city official, what you call the, the mayor, for example, uh, that were governing those municipios will be now replaced by what today we call simply the district courts. The district court governs the entire county. Okay. They're heading the entire county and says so the Americans are simply doing away with the alcaldes and simply bringing in their district courts instead. Uh, also, uh, Sam Houston is going to create, of course, uh, uh, a force 
that will be patrolling the countryside, the ranges, uh, the prairies, uh, all the Texas territory will be patrolled uh, to maintain order. And those were the Texas Rangers. Okay, so this is the creation again of Texas Rangers that were initially made up of volunteers, what we call local militias. Uh, well, militias were simply volunteers that, uh, that volunteered to guard a particular town uh, whenever the town was to be raided by Indians, etc. Uh, this is coming again from the United States. This is the tradition of the United States going back to the colonial period. You know, the colonies had its own system of volunteers called militias, by the way. So we're gonna see the introduction of a similar system that in Texas will simply evolve into a formal uh, structure, a formal force called the Texas Rangers that will be permanently patrolling all of the settlements, okay? So the Lamar presidency, okay, comes after Sam Houston, the vice president, is going to uh, run for the presidency in 1839. Sam Houston could not run consecutive, consecutive terms. So he is going to actually run uh, in 1841, by the way. He's going to run again, and he's going to win the election, you know, in 1841. But in the meantime, he can't run in 1839. So he's vice president. Uh, President Lamar is going to actually uh, uh, compete in this in those that presidential race, and he's actually going to become again the second president of the Texas Republic uh, from 1839 to 41. Now, what's significant about Lamar is that um, Lamar was, even though he was the vice president, he was in sharp disagreement with. Houston's policies, okay? Uh, he uh, uh, was seriously opposed to uh, particularly a couple of policies, by the way. Of course, he was in serious disagreement about so many different issues. For example, the printing of money. You know, he did not want to devalue, you know, the Texas dollar. He did not really want to print as much money as possible and so on. He wanted to be a more conservative you know, uh, uh, you know, financier, you know, kind of conserving money, saving money and the like. Uh, so yeah, he opposed uh, Houston on, on that ground. But what Lamar really was opposed to here is Houston's Indian policy. Okay. Uh, Lamar comes from Georgia. Okay. The state of Georgia that had had issues uh, with Native American groups, okay, uh, both in, in Georgia, of course. Uh, there were specifically, specifically two different uh, Native American groups that in different time periods have had issues, had had actually conflicts with the peoples of Georgia, the Creeks and the Cherokees. So it is precisely Lamar's personal experience coming from Georgia, coming from a region that was ridden with Indian conflict that as vice president, you know, during Houston's term, he's going to oppose his attitude, Houston's policies with the Native Americans, uh, not to engage the natives and trying to pretty much create a state of peace because Houston really believed that those, you know, wars, those conflicts were draining the treasury. We're going to create a large debt in the country. But Lamar had an opposing viewpoint and he's now going to change and overturn Houston's policy. And instead, he is going to pursue a more anti-Indian policy. Okay, he's going to, you know, engage with Native American groups, initiate a series uh, of campaigns. And again, uh, Houston, of course, is not really content with this, even though he's no longer the president uh, from afar. Houston is, again, very much opposed uh, to those policies because they're counterproductive. They're indeed going to create more debt 
and they're going to disrupt even perhaps even commercial relationships with the Native Americans. In other words, you know, you are going to do away with a very important trading partner, Houston said. You know, the Indians can can prove to be very, very useful, very beneficial for Texas in terms of trade, but you're doing away with that, of course, uh, because of his experience, of course. He also opposed annexation in the United States, Lamar. Lamar opposed U.S. annexation because he believed that Texas had everything to become a very wealthy nation in the future, perhaps a future power to reckon with. He really believed that there were rich resources in the country, yeah, uh, that there were prime land, you know, for farming, for ranching, for plantations. And later on, of course, what he's actually thinking is also, also, you know, more development in terms of railroads, international trade, etc. So he has a grand vision of Texas that says, look, why be annexed in the United States when we can actually just become, again, a very wealthy power. Uh, we can trade with nations, we can, you know, invite investors in our country and the like. So again, we just don't don't need to become another state. Uh, so again, that was another issue that divided, of course, Lamar and Houston. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, he went ahead and because there were money lacking in Texas, there's not an overabundance of money, he nonetheless went ahead and began to print money as well. He printed actually about three million you know dollars in currency uh, in Texas and contributing of course to the devaluation of 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 that currency, but nonetheless he believed that to be very necessary to finance the new nation. Uh, another important contribution of Lamar is that he moved the capital from Houston. It was actually initially located in Houston, the city of Houston, named after Sam Houston, by the way. This is where Sam Houston lives. This is his main region where he he's building his main uh, political connections. His strongest influence of Houston is in the uh, East Coast and the Houston area. And he decides to move precisely because of the influence of Houston uh, decides to move the capital of Texas to Austin. You know, so he, this is the beginning stages of Austin as the main capital. He was also very much involved in building the very first schools and a few colleges, the public education system, Lamar, that is to say, very much involved in trying to create education, uh, to, you know, create literacy in the, for the Texas population. Like I said, you know, he reignited uh, Indian campaign, so his Indian policy was, uh, you know, changing the course uh, that Houston had established, and he's engaged in a series of Indian campaigns. He's also going to be sending, uh, you know, uh, uh, a regiment to Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the so-called expedition of 1841-42. This is going to be also another attempt to subdue the population of Santa Fe deal with some resistance that was in that area. And because now, of course, there's problems between the peoples of New Mexico and Texas. There's a dispute, there's a territorial dispute, and he's trying to settle that dispute by sending an expedition into Santa Fe, New Mexico again. So he's going to get, you know, Texas engaged in a series of conflicts, uh, by the way, that are not going to be uh, very wise in terms of the finances. Uh, something, of course, that Sam Houston is going to revert once he comes back again into the presidency in 1841. So also he uh, developed something called the Homestead Act of 1839. The uh, Homestead Act is really uh, s similarly to what Houston was doing, uh, land grants, a system of land grants for families willing to establish their own farms. Okay, so he wants the creation of farms by awarding lands to families willing to work the land and create, you know, farming, okay, uh, or any other kind of enterprise. This was the Homestead Act of 1839. And also he resorts to the old, you know, strategy of uh, using empresario contracts. Again, you know, pretty much giving a land grant uh, to an empresario, to a land developer, to colonize a region 
in order to bring people from different parts of uh, the United States or Europe, etc., and develop a colony for the purpose of, again, yeah, developing the state as well, developing the land, creating enterprises, and creating wealth for the state. Okay, so we're going to make a stop here because we already reached our limit. Again, we're trying to stay within the confines of the hour and 20 minutes or thereabouts, again, for every session. So we're going to make a stop here so when we come back, we still have to look at the Texas economy in the Republic and Texas society. I mean, it's very important to look at the uh, multiplicity of different ethnic groups. We're going to look at all the social groups of Texas. And in session two, we're going to look at the process of annexation. Okay. The process by which Texas will be annexed uh, into the union. And that's how that annexation is going to set off a conflict uh, with Mexico. The United States and Mexico will be disputing the boundaries between Texas and Mexico, the region I just showed you uh, in green that extended ar along the Rio Grande all the way to New Mexico. And this is going to set off the, the so-called Mexican-American War. And we're going to look at that war and the outcome as well in session two when we come back. Okay, that's all I have for you. And I'll see you then in session two. Thank you.